Hi everyone. Today we'll be looking at the paper Tool Former, um, which is a language model which has taught itself how to use tools. So um, this paper tries to um, address some of the limitations seen in uh, current large language models, right? Um, some of them being that uh, they're not really uh, good in recording contemporaneous events. Um, they sometimes tend to generate data which may not stick to the context provided and uh, they may have poor mathematical skills uh, to give precise results for even simple questions. And also they may be unaware of the progression of time. Right? So uh, the main idea of the paper is to um, augment the language model uh, with the usage of external APIs. So you can then use the results from these APIs to address some of the issues shown here. Um, and um, so they want the tools to be um, learned which tool to be used when to be learned in a self-supervised way uh, and they don't require uh, they, they they don't want to have a data set which is a la large number of human annotations and they also want to uh, keep the generality where uh, they want the language model itself to know which tool to use when right so this figure is um, an illustration of uh, the tool former in action. Um, so for example here, um, the tool former is using the calculator tool. Um, so you have text which is out of 1400 participants, 400 or, and the language model knows that it needs to uh, call the calculator API and it also inserts the question to the calculator API and then continues the text. Okay? Um, so in this way, I think the results of the language model will be more precise compared to if you allow the language model to generate the data. So um, they do so by um, fine tuning their language model on a data set which has these API calls. Right? That, that's what they call LM data set with API calls. And um, they use um, in-context learning to be able to uh, generate a data set. Right, from a language model data set. Uh, they are uh, using in-context learning to generate data set which um, has these API calls and questions to the API populated. So we'll see in a bit how they do that. But um, they try to use the language model itself to generate the data set. That's the main idea here. Um, so, and they distinguish between two scenarios, right? Uh, whenever an API needs to be called, they use the token API. And then um, at the end of the API, uh, so the API call basically will have which tool to use, and they call this AC. And then it will have an input to the API call. They call it IC. And then slash API denotes the end of this uh, API. And uh, they distinguish this case where they haven't invoked the API with another case where they have invoked the API. Right. Um, once they invoke the API, they get a result from the uh, API, and that is basically appended with your API um, and your input uh, by using this arrow and R, and then they uh, use the slash API to denote that this API string has ended here. Right? And um, how they generate these uh, APIs are uh, through in-context learning. So here they have a prompt, right? Uh, where you have a description of the task here and uh, here they spell out for each of the APIs they use. Um, they exactly spell out what the model should be generating and also the way in which the model should be generating the output. And they also provide a couple of examples of the input and how they want to transform it to an output which has the API and also the input to the API. And the, the idea is then when they feed the language model with the input X, right? And that input would be similar to whatever inputs you have in your um, in-context um, demonstrations. You're going to get an output which is similar to what you have um, shown the model in the uh, demonstrations. So that's the idea. So, um, so now we have a way in which we can basically get the um, API call as well as the input to the API. So the next question is, where do you insert these uh, API calls? So if you recall here, let's look at the calculator example, right? Um, the API call is inserted at this position, 
Now there are multiple locations where you can insert the API call, right? You want the language model to learn where to insert the API call. It could be here or it could be here or it could be here, right? So the way in which they decide where to insert the API is basically by measuring the probability of the API token, right? Uh, if you recall, every API call is preceded with this token API, which is a special token uh, to indicate the start of um, the API string. So um, they measure, they feed the prompt and as well as um, they feed the input. So now, um, if, and then they measure the um, probability of the next token being API. And um, they feed the input up until the ith position. So if you want to find out whether you need to insert the API call in the ith position, you'd feed input from one to i minus one along with your prompt. And then you measure what the probability of API token is. And then you keep track of the top k uh, probabilities. Those are candidate positions where you can insert your API calls. And then what you do is uh, you would basically sample uh, the outputs which are generated from the language model when you insert your prompt um, I-1 tokens and then API, right, which is telling you the start of the API string. And then you basically um, allow the generation to continue until you hit the slash API token or the end of sequence token. And uh, once you generate an API string, the next thing is to basically invoke the API, right? And the invocation they say is done by many different ways. It could be as simple as executing a Python script or using a retrieval system to perform search or using another neural network, etc. right? So once you invoke the API, you get a result RI. Now, um, you need to filter out the good and bad APIs so that your data set only has good quality of API calls. So the way they do that is basically by measuring the probability of future tokens, given that you have your input and also you have your um, API call with the result or without the result, right? So, um, so your loss is your um, um, weighted cross entropy loss, right? Um, so now let's say um, here um, you have API calls where you um, just insert the API string. So this would be your API and you have your which API to call and you also have your input to the API and you have slash API, right? So this basically means that the API has not yet been invoked and then you measure the loss when you invoke your API. So now um, you're measuring the probability of the next token given the string, the API string, and also the result of the um, invoked API. And you're saying, if suppose I incorporate the result of the API, if that is lowering my loss or increasing the probability of the next token, then that is a good API call. And they have a certain threshold. If it's above a particular threshold, they say it's a good API call. So to demonstrate it, let's take um, this example, right? Um, let's assume that the input is Coca-Cola or uh, Coca-Cola or, and at this point, you have this particular API call, right? So now you come and compare uh, different losses. So let's just take a look at um, Li of Epsilon, which is a null string, which is what is the probability of Coke given Coca-Cola or, right? You have not inserted any uh, API string here yet. That would be your Li Epsilon. And then uh, you would then uh, you would calculate the loss according to the equation here. And then you come compute the loss when you insert the API call, but you don't incorporate the result, right? That is this guy here. So um, that would basically be what, what is the probability of Coke Given the context, Coca-Cola or QA, what other name is Coca-Cola known by? And then you basically find out what the loss is when you incorporate the result of the API as well. So that would be, um, what is the probability of Coke given Coca-Cola or this API string and also executing the API string and getting the result. Maybe you get a result like Coke or whatever, right? Then what is the probability of Coke? 
Ideally, the probability should go up when you have something more relevant to this particular token, right? So only if the uh, probability of the next token XJ goes up when you insert the result of the API call, will you qualify that API call as a good API call, right? And you um, and and they have a certain threshold. It should be above that thre threshold, and then you are basically retaining those. So what you've essentially done is you've filtered the API calls to retain only the ones which are good enough. So now um, you have gone from a data set, which let, let's call it C, to another data set C star, which has all these API calls which are inserted. So you've used a language model to generate a new data set by using uh, in-context learning. And then what you do is the fine tuning of the language model with this new data set C star, which has these API calls. So this is going to teach the language model how to, um, which API to generate when, and what should be the input for the API. It's going to teach the language model that. And then during inference time, uh, so if you recall, you need to invoke the API, and that's different from the decoding process. So they are going to um, perform regular decoding until you get this um, arrow. This is when you need to externally call the API, and then that's what they do. They interrupt the decoding process and get a response. And then they basically append the um, response and the API token. So you get RI and the slash API token, and you continue generation. And they experiment with different tools, um, question answering. And for this, they basically uh, use another language model, Atlas, which is a retrieval augmented language model. And for calculator, they use um, the calculator tool, which can give you more precise calculations. And for Wikipedia search, um, they use another search engine that would basically return a uh, short Wikipedia text. And for machine translation, again, they have another language model that can translate from one language to any other language. And uh, for the experiments, they use uh, GPT-J. And they use um, CCNet dataset. And they generate their, they call it C, and they generate their own new data set C star using prompting. And um, so this is how they weight their uh, cross entropy loss, right? Uh, if you see, um, they have different weights for different tokens, and that is to make sure that the tokens which are very close to the API call are um, weighted more. And uh, because these, those are the ones. Uh, whose probability you need to increase by incorporating the API call. And then these are some details on the fine tuning of the model, um, the learning rate, batch size, and linear warm up. And um, so they use multiple baselines. The first one is GPTJ, which is pre-trained. Uh, there's no fine tuning. And then they have GPTJ, which is again fine tuned on the CCNet data set. That is their C, the initial data set they used. And then the third one is Toolformer, where they've created their own data set C star from C. And then they have fine-tuned on GPTJ. And then they have Toolformer disabled. So if you, uh, Toolformer needs to invoke those API calls. So um, Toolformer is, uh, Toolformer disabled is when you have the API strings from C star, but you don't really invoke the API calls. And then um, they evaluate on a bunch of um, downstream tasks, and they evaluate it in a zero-shot setup. So zero-shot is uh, similar to what we had here, um, right? minus the demonstrations. You basically just give the input, and you say, give me the result for this. Right? Um, and then they evaluate it on a bunch of different data sets. So Llama, Llama basically on subsets of Llama, which check the factoid, um, which basically has a bunch of factoid questions. And they find that Toolformer performs uh, better compared to the other baseline models. And in some cases, it also performs, uh, not some, in all cases in these three data sets, it performs better than a GPT-3 model, which is pretty huge because uh, your tool former has just 6 billion parameters, around 6 billion parameters, and they're comparing it with a very large model, which has 175 billion parameters. And um, they also evaluate it on mathematical reasoning. Um, and you find that tool former uh, outperforms even large language models like GPT-3. And 
question answering. Uh, you see that it outperforms the other baselines, but then probably doesn't perform as good as GPT-3. And then um, the, you have multilingual question answering. And here you see that um, in some cases, for some languages like German, and maybe um, Arabic, and also Chinese, you find that Toolformer, the performance of Toolformer is even worse than the baseline. And they attribute this to maybe there is a distribution shift in the data which GPTJ was originally pre-trained on and the new uh, data set we've generated. Um, and also with uh, temporal data sets, they find that Toolformer performs better compared to uh, the other models. So, so now basically you have taken GPTJ, which is a language model, and then you have fine-tuned it on a different um, data set C star which has these API calls, which may not be very natural text. So they, they want to see if uh, this fine-tuned model, which is fine-tuned on this uh, new data set, uh, retains its original language modeling capabilities. They do this by measuring the perplexity of different uh, of, of their tool farmer, and they compare it with the original GPTJ, and they find that it's not very far off. So, um, Perplexity basically tells you how probable um, sequences of words are, sequences of tokens are, and uh, they find that they are not very far off from the GPTJ baseline, uh, which means they have not sacrificed the language modeling capabilities of the model by fine tuning it on this uh, data set. And then they find that, um, so they, uh, and then they look at the scaling of uh, Toolformer. They compare it with, um, Toolformer being disabled. So this is when they don't incorporate the results from the Toolformer, uh, from the APIs which are generated, right? Um, and they find that um, beyond a particular uh, model parameter size, uh, it's beneficial to actually use, uh, augment your language model with these external API calls, right? You can see that there is considerable gap when Toolformer is enabled and when it's disabled especially on these uh, factoid related uh, data sets, mathematical reasoning data sets, and also question answering data sets. And then they highlight the limitations of uh, Toolformer and they say that right now you're only able to call one API um, and you're not able to use the output of an API into as input to another API. So you're not able to chain the tools, right? And the next is um, you're not able to use the tools in an interactive way. That's another limitation. And also the prompts, uh, the output which is generated by the language model for your API strings, they're very, se very sensitive to the prompts which are fed into the language model. Um, so these are some of the limitations. So you need to basically uh, come up with these, come up with good manual annotations to be able to generate uh, meaningful uh, API strings from the language model. So, um, so in conclusion, um, Toolformer is a language model uh, that learns how to use um, these external tools, such as calculator, search engines, by API calls. And then um, they accomplish this by fine-tuning a language model on uh, API calls. Right? And they generated this API calls data set by using uh, prompting. And they also make sure that they filter these API calls so that the perplexity of future tokens are low. They only retain the good API calls in their data set.